and welcome to Fantastic History. I'm Clay. And I'm Sarah. We're a husband and wife duo who enjoy telling each other about amazing events, people, and mysteries throughout history. Sarah. Yes. Did you know that TLC Channel, uh, formerly known as the Learning Channel, (laughs) was originally created by the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare and NASA to transmit educational content to public schools and universities? (laughs) How did that go? (laughs) I don't know. So how did we go from that to Honey Boo Boo (laughs) and my and 1000 Pound Sisters and 90 Day Fiance and all of that? I mean, I do still feel like I've learned a lot. It's just not stuff I wish I knew. Yeah, it's sort of like I want to be these people and then thank God I'm not these people. Right, yeah. I don't know. It's in the 2000s, it seems like something happened to educational television. Um, oh, yeah. Like T- TLC, Discovery, History, History. Channel. Mm-hmm. They all just kind of went to trash, you know? Oh, yeah, I know. Well, I, one show I remember well from that era was not necessarily trash TV, but it was about trash it was called hoarders <gasps> oh yeah remember hoarders oh my dad and i loved hoarders mm-hmm. and hoarders was a pretty great show very sad but exposed a lot of people to the mental disorder of compulsive hoarding that's been around for quite a long time right well the story i want to tell you about today is of america's first hoarders at least from the perspective of like a public spectacle oh okay is that Howard Hughes? It is not. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> um, I got a lot of the information for this episode from uh, newspaper articles of the era, um, but also a, a, a few books uh, like Stuff, Compulsive, Hoarding, and the Meaning of Things, and Weird New York, Your Travel Guide to New York's Local Legends and Best Kept Secrets. Ooh. Okay, Sarah. Okay. The Collier Brothers. Claimed to be descendants of one of America's oldest families coming over on the Speedwell, which arrived just one week after the Mayflower. Okay. Their great-grandfather had built one of the largest shipyards in Manhattan, and their great-uncle ran the first steamboat on the Hudson. Whoa. The brother's father was Herman Livingston Collier, an eccentric gynecologist who was known to canoe to and from work across Manhattan's East River. I gotta say, just if we can time out, an eccentric gynecologist is the last thing I ever want to hear in my life. I know, right? I want to vomit. It's, it sounds like a Wayne Brady comedy. I hate that combination of words. It's not great. No. Their mother was Susie Gage Frost Collier, an opera singer and also Herman's first cousin. Mm. They gave birth to three children, though the first daughter died after four months for unknown reasons. Mm. In 1881, they welcomed their first son, Homer, who was followed by their second, Langley, in 1885. Oh, boy. Homer and Langley. Yeah, wow. Okay. In 1909, Dr. Collier moved the family out of their cold water tenement and into a fashionable four-story brownstone (gasps) in Harlem at 2078 Fifth Avenue. It is in this home that the family estate amassed much of what would become the foundation of the brother's hoard. Oh, boy. Their mother assembled a library of more than 25,000 books for her (gasps) sons. Both studied at Columbia University, where Homer received a degree in admiralty law and practiced for a short time. Langley studied electrical and mechanical engineering, but I was not able to find a a record of him actually having a job. Interesting. Except some passing information about him possibly being a piano salesman. Okay. By 1920, the parents had separated, and the brothers chose to remain with their mother in that same brownstone. Their father died in 1923, leaving the brothers all of his possessions, which was vast, and included a Ford Model T. Ooh. Their brothers took it all and even put the car disassembled in the basement. Oh, okay. Well. Then their mother passed in 1929, leaving the brothers alone together in the brownstone. Now, the story of the Collier brothers has morphed over the years from tragic, beneath-the-fold sensationalism to a bit of folklore as Mm -hmm. well, Mm -hmm. almost mythical. Right. So some of my research dates don't exactly match up because of how the story has morphed Mm -hmm. over time, even probably right up the day they were reported. So I will try to present the story as accurately as I can using my best judgment of how things went from here. Okay. Because things are going to get weird. I'm 
so excited. After their mother's passing, the brothers began to slowly withdraw from society. And it's known that they were start, starting to sort of do this even before they passed as well. But things were changing in the world that sort of um, increased uh, this. Now, part of this could have been due to the changing demographics of Harlem during the Great Depression. Okay. The wealthy white population had found themselves to be less wealthy mm-hmm. during the Great Depression. Oh, yeah. And they were leaving the area while the poor African-American population began to move in. I see. Mm -hmm. Crime was also increasing in Harlem at this time, but the Collier brothers were not interested in leaving. Instead, they withdraw inward. They didn't pay their bills and soon shut off their telephone, then their gas, and later their electricity. You can't be living in New York City without power in the wintertime. Like, best of luck. Mm -hmm. Mm. They were in frequent trouble with the city and the mortgage company for refusal to pay taxes or bills. But it was not from lack of money that the brothers gave up utilities. In fact, their finances were pretty good because of their family's wealth and their own frugal living. Mm -hmm. In fact, Homer had purchased a lot across the street with the intention of developing apartments. But these plans never came to fruition because tragedy would soon strike the following year when Homer went blind due to hemorrhages behind his eyes. Oh, man! Langley, devoted to his brother, further withdrew into the brownstone to care for his brother full-time and would only come out at night to purchase food. For water, he filled buckets from a pump four blocks away. For heat, they would burn kerosene lamps. Oh, God. Langley claimed that he had been able to create electricity using parts from the Model T in their basement. Okay. With neither brother trusting doctors and instead relying on their own sense and a vast vast amount of... um, research publications Mm. left from their father, I Mm -hmm. think amounting in the uh, 10,000 books or something like that. Uh, Langley went about treating Homer's blindness through natural remedies. I don't know if that's the best way to treat, you know, blindness blindness caused by hemorrhages in your eyes. Well, honey, we are not the sons of eccentric gynecologists. And you know what? Honestly, as much as I'd like the money, thank God. (laughs) Thank God. Well, these natural remedies included a diet of 100 oranges a week. (laughs) Yes, that that is true. That is true. And rest, believing this would help cure him. Was this the only thing he ate was oranges? No, it was just... Oh, my God. It was thought that it would help (laughs) for whatever reason. Reporters were able to catch up with Langley on several occasions and asked him why his brother and he remained so reclusive while they chose to live this way. One of his responses was, all we want is for people to leave us alone. A man's home is his castle. What we do inside it is our business. That sounds a little mcpoyle to me <laughs> mcpoyle <laughs> yeah like it replace milk with oranges and these are the mcpoyle brothers well they don't eat they, they, they're not eating for pleasure they're eating for uh, medicinal purposes i think that's what the milk is yeah <laughs> okay <let's see. laughs> now it's unclear when the hoarding truly began it may have been happening when the mother was still alive or started after the brothers became so much more reclusive but what is known is that over the years, the brother, brothers filled the brownstone with anything that caught their eye. Mm. Langley had once been a concert pianist. And then he's, we believe he was selling pianos at a time, which makes sense because among the items inside the house were 14 pianos. Whoa. 10 grand pianos. Whoa. Including one that Langley claims was given to his mother by Queen Victoria. Oh, okay. Yeah, hold on to that one. Stacks and stacks of newspapers were kept in the home, Mm -hmm. an archive of years and years of news that Langley kept so that when his brother's eyesight returned, he could catch up on past events. That's a little bit precious. Mm. Rumors spread across the neighborhood about the strange brothers, and people would stand outside their home hoping to catch a peek inside Mm. or find out what hid inside the home. This resulted in their home becoming the targets of vandalism and break-in attempts. That's not cool. It seems in an attempt to combat this, Langley blockaded the entrances of the home with a wall of rubbish, ensuring that no one would be able to get inside easily, though Langley himself was able to get in and out fairly easily for his supplies. The brownstone was already fallen into a state of repair by the early 1930s. Leaks in the roof were rotting away the upper floor, 
and animals were able to get inside with ease. Mm. But because of the brother's secrecy and unwillingness to let anyone into their home, no one truly knew what lay inside the Collier homestead. As time went on, Homer's condition worsened. In 1940, he became paralyzed as a result of inflammatory rheumatism. Now blind and paralyzed, the brothers still refused medical treatment. They feared that the doctors would cut Homer's optic nerve, blinding him permanently, Mm -hmm. and they would give him drugs that would kill him faster. Langley stated, you must remember that we are sons of a doctor. We have a medical library of 15,000 books in our home. We decided that we would not call any doctor. You see, we knew too much about medicine. But a very specific type of medicine that would not apply to either of you, if I I might point that out. It's true. Homer was a lawyer, and Langley went to school for engineering. Mm -hmm. However, this is what they chose. With Homer now completely unable to care for himself, his brother kept him in one room and tended to his every need. Langley fed and bathed Homer, read him books from their impressive library, and they listened to the radio. He was very protective of his brother. Just one year before, the electric company Consolidated Edison had obtained a court order to collect their electric meters that were no longer being used inside Mm. because the electricity had been turned off. Right. When they attempted to break into the house to collect their (gasps) property, they were met with a wall of boxes, papers, and other rubbish, an (laughs) impenetrable blockade. Wow. Langley then appeared on the second floor, cursing them for trying to enter his home, and he did eventually make them leave, but he did allow them to come and take the, the meters as well. Though after this incident, Langley's encounters with the outside world would become much more antagonistic. Mm. In 1942, the bank foreclosed on the Collier due to failure to pay their mortgage in over a decade. Oh, yikes. It took them that long to foreclose. That's amazing. They now owed um, $6,700, but the bank deemed the property theirs. They intended on repairing the house before any further damage could occur. Oh, boy. When the workers appeared in the morning, Langley shooed them off. And he was able to successfully do this. But a couple of months later, the bank and city officials went back to the house to evict the brothers and take possession of the brownstone. Oh, boy. As they attempted to enter the house, a crowd gathered to catch a glimpse inside the mystery house. I mean, this was fascinating. People have been wondering about this for years. Oh, yeah. Officials attempted to enter through the front and back door, even breaking down the doors with axes. But the barricade, they, they, they couldn't get past it. Right. It, it, was, it was like a brick wall. Wow. to them so they decided to try to access the house through the second story a second story a window mm-hmm. after three hours of work the officials had only been able to make their way a couple of feet into the house due to the just the staggering amount of stuff blocking their way oh my god by this time langley was aware of their presence and demanded that his lawyer john mcmullen come to this the elderly lawyer made his way to the second <laughs> story and inside the house following a tunnel and made his way through the rubbish, a myriad of items, until he found himself in the parlor, and he found the defiant Langley waiting for him. Mm -hmm. McMullen told him that the only way to avoid eviction was to pay the past mortgage payments. Right, yeah. It is said that Langley handed McMullen cash, the amount that was owed, the equivalent of $120,000 today. Oh, boy. Just in cash. Yeah. Yeah. And then ordered everyone out. Get out. (laughs) It's over. Later that same year, in 1942, an acquaintance of the brothers, Sergeant Collins, heard a rumor that Homer had died inside the home. Oh, God. So he made his way to the Colliers, convinced Langley to come and let him inside and verify that Homer was alive. And Langley actually agreed to this. What Sergeant Collins saw inside the Brownstone is beyond anything that you could imagine on maybe an episode of Hoarders. Mm. I haven't seen all the episodes, but... Well, it was no intervention, but it was pretty good. Mm. The buildings, the building was filled to the ceiling with all types of rubbish, junk, and items. Langley had created a maze of tunnels and set traps along the way to foil any bur- burglars that found their way inside. Whoa! Some traps were intended to trap and others to kill. Oh my god! Also among the refuse were live cats and rats, mostly finding their way inside due to the poor state of the home, exposing it to the elements. It took the pair 30 minutes to navigate the maze of tunnels, 
avoiding booby traps and traversing the sea of junk until finally they came to a small clearing. And there in that clearing was Homer Collier. Uh, Collins was the first person to see Homer in over two years, but Homer was indeed alive. Oh, thank God. But in a poorly state. Well, yeah. His He's knees were... been eating 14 oranges a day, so. <laughs> his knees were pulled up to his chest, permanently stuck there due to his <gasps> paralysis. Oh. He sat, on, he sat on a cot with an overcoat over his frail body. Oh. He said to Collins, I am Homer L. Collier, lawyer. I want your badge and shield number. I am not dead. <gasps> oh, my. The brothers were unique. It, yes. Eccentric. Mm-hmm. Um... And, 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 and after reading about them, it does seem that both Homer and Langley were just, they were, they were private. Yeah. They just kind of wanted to be left alone. They were, they were quirky fellas. Mm-hmm. Um, well, but, I certainly know someone like that. <laughs> but clearly they still had a, a great wit about mm-hmm. them. Now, this would be the last time anyone besides his brother would speak to Homer from here on out. The brothers continued to live inside the rotting brownstone among their collection for the next five years, until March 21st, 1947, when an anonymous caller contacted the 122nd Police Precinct to again claim that one or both of the brothers were dead. Mm. But this time they stated that a smell of decomposition was coming from the house. Oh, yuck. Police were dispatched to investigate the report. But unlike other times when they had made their way to the home and made enough ruckus, Langley would come out and greet them. Mm-hmm. This time, they were not met with anyone. Oh. The officers were unable to find entrance into the home, as was the case for visitors before. All the doors were locked. Windows were covered with iron bars. And when they for- tried to force open a door, they were met with that wall. Just that barricade mm-hmm. of newspapers, beds, chairs, boxes, old sewing machines, a wine press, and many, many other various pieces of junk that had once caught the eye of Langley. Their attempts to gain entrance through a second-story window was met with the same problem, just a, a, just a wall of right. stuff. Facing no other option, the officers began to just pull stuff out of the house, throwing it onto the street below. Now, as you can imagine, this caused quite, quite a crowd to form. Yeah. As people had been waiting years to catch a glimpse inside the famous Collier ghost house. Ooh, I love that. Officers worked for four, five hours, digging through the rubbish to gain access into the house, throwing onto the street cardboard boxes, a baby carriage, umbrellas, gardening equipment, and countless other items that had made their way into the house. And finally, they themselves were able to gain access into the house into the parlor where they found Homer Lusk Collier. He was sitting on his cot, covered in a tattered bathrobe, his head resting on his knees. He had been dead for 10 hours. A medical examiner determined the cause of death was starvation and heart disease. Oh, no. But of course, this led to the next question. Where was Langley? They suspected that perhaps Langley himself had made the call and fled the house. So an officer was posted outside to wait in case Langley returned, and they sent they they let media know the situation. And reports of sightings of Langley poured in from nine up to nine states away, and and there was a police search, manhunts, following all these tips, but Langley could not be found. After three days passed and he did not appear at his brother's funeral, police turned their attention to the possibility that the younger Collier was still somewhere inside the house. That was going to be my guess. They began to search inside while removing more items as they went, throwing newspapers, books, and more out the window as a crowd of up to 2,000 watched the spectacle. The collection of objects pulled from the house ran the gamut from mundane to extraordinary, rubbish to collectible. Their library of 25,000 books and a sizable art collection of paintings and sculptures, as well as a as baby carriages, gardening equipment, an old x-ray machine, glass chandeliers, bowling balls, the top of a horse-drawn carriage, (laughs) the remains of that Model T, still there, musical instruments, including the 14 pianos, Mm -hmm. eight live cats, and, disturbingly, human organs and a deformed fetus floating in jars. Okay, well. These were likely left from his father's estate. That was going to, yeah, I still don't like it. No, not not really. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. And of course garbage lots and lots of garbage 
In all, workers removed approximately 120 tons <gasps> from the Collier's house. Oh, that's that's enough, certainly. Mm-hmm. Items that could be auctioned off were, but this only netted $2,000. Really? Yes, the rest was deemed worthless or too damaged to be sold and were disposed of. The home itself was in such a great state of disrepair with the holes in the walls, or the holes in the roof and the walls caving in, that it was deemed unsafe and a fire hazard. And it was torn down in July of that same year. Wow. Nearly three weeks after police had found Homer Collier, workers did find Langley. He was found only 10 feet away from Homer in a collapsed tunnel of trash. <gasps> It's thought that while bringing his brother food, Langley inadvertently set off one of his traps. Oh, my God. Causing a suitcase, three metal bread boxes, and a heap of newspapers to pin him to the floor and restrict his breathing. Oh, my God. The cause of death, death was determined to be asphyxiation. Being so close to his brother, Homer may have heard the calamity occur. Oh. But in his condition, he was unable to call for help for his brother or himself. That is awful. Yeah. So wait, who called? Whoever smelled the decomposition. Uh, okay. Right, probably mm. a neighbor. They, okay. They were buried next to their parents at Cypress Hill Cemetery. After the brownstone was dem- demolished, a nonprofit purchased the spot where it once stood and erected a pocket park named Collier Brothers Park, which Aww. still remains there to this day. That's cute. A reminder to passersby of a somewhat forgotten oddity. Collier is still a name that invokes an infamous history. A Collier mansion is a phrase used by modern firefighters as a term for a home or <laughs> dwelling filled with so much trash that it's a hazard to its occupants and responders. Uh-huh. Their story has been adapted into books and episodes of television. It's common and reasonable to see their story as pitiful and horrific. But I'd like to end this story by looking at the Collier brothers in just a little bit of a different way. They rejected the world around them and chose to live in their own privacy, completely disconnected and on their own terms. Their choice to live outside norms of society certainly sealed their fate, but it was their choice. And I think this quote from them says the best. When Langley told a reporter they have no telephone and they didn't open their mail and they only spent time with one another, he said, you can't imagine how free we feel. That's really nice. Yeah. And that is the story of the Collier brothers. It reminds me a lot of, there's a Shirley Jackson novella called We Have Always Lived in the Castle. And it reminds me a lot of that. So that was, yeah, that's kind of the the vibe I was getting. Like the sisters in that book aren't hoarders Mm -hmm. per se, but it's, they are very eccentric and, kind of shunned by the town so they stay in their house and people are always like looking through the gate like what's in there there's got to be millions of dollars in that house they're locked up in there with all their money and it reminded me a lot of that yeah there's been a lot of books written about either like using their names uh, but uh, fictionalizing the, the events or using different names but now that you know the story obviously are pulling from this because it was a it was a huge sensational story i'm gonna look into that i want to see if if she was inspired by that well everyone thank you for listening i hope you enjoyed that story and if you did hey why don't you give us a rating (laughs) on your favorite podcast website and um, please give us a or shoot us an email at fantastic history pod at gmail.com with other suggestions you may have or just to say what you thought about our episodes Uh, Please check us out on Twitter and Instagram. For more content, we are Fantastic H Pod on both. And we will see you next week. Bye bye.